So, Rolika, you are feeling top of the world. So many awards. No, never satisfied, never happy. <laughs> we are more happy than you, actually. So, I'm glad I made you happy. <laughs> hmm. Anyways, you were saying that time. Yeah. By recollecting her awards. <laughs> So Sunil, yeah, you say, yeah, okay. Good evening, everyone. Welcome back. Welcome back from AIOC. And uh, here we are in iFocus Online, Lecture 209, Retina Session 61. And it's an exam special by Dr. Chaitra Jayadev, ma'am. And she'll be talking on the short cases in retina. I request Dr. Alit Verma, sir, to please introduce Dr. Chaitra, ma'am. You see, Dr. Chaitra, uh, I think, is a national figure today. Uh, she looks young, but uh, she is very, very experienced. You see, if nobody had told, she looks one of the hot speed participants only. Uh, but uh, believe me, she has a lot of experience <laughs> and clarity of, uh, uh, you know, subject and a lot of achievements. If you see, she is already head of uh, veteran service at uh, and in Bangalore. More important, what I uh, you know remember, a lot of awards, a lot of achievements at very, very young age. As she has contributed to IGO in a very big way. I remember, you see, she has been on IGO till both for a very, very long time. And uh, I had, in fact, told her, why don't you take over IGO? And uh, finally, she agreed that she may, you know, uh, come as a editor of IGO. And that will be one of the happy moments for Indian ophthalmology. And she has been an asset for IGO. If you see all her, uh, you know, CV here, 130 indexed publications, uh, you know, are there. And if you notice, you see how much time she has devoted to IGO. It's, uh, you know, nearly two decades. So one of the, one of the ablest person to, you know, to be uh, the IGO uh, editor or uh, she already does it, in fact, I know. And presently she is a joint secretary of AIOS and, uh, and chair secretary of KOS also. So huge number of, uh, you know, uh, achievements at this young age. And today what she is going to tell us, you know, we have already, Chaitra, finished uh, 60, 60 episodes of uh, retina, starting from embryology to, you know, uh, teleophthalmology and, and even uh, artificial retina, argus, so many things have been covered. So this episode, uh, you know, further episodes also, two, three episodes, uh, Rolika, are exam special episodes, which yes. will help the, you know, uh, young people, even old people also, to learn about cases, short cases, long cases, so that uh, you know they can they can in a short possible time come to diagnosis, approach to management, what is the to order, what management to do. So uh, thanks, Chetra, for uh, joining us on iFocus, and it's one of the most liveliest and most uh, watched program uh, in ophthalmology all across, I think, uh, all across the globe, in fact. And we are uh, really proud to have you here. Over to thanks you. to you, sir. <laughs> So I couldn't have got a better introduction. Uh, really privileged that uh, you had to give my uh, intro. And uh, and it's really a privilege to be at iFocus. I've been wanting to uh, be a part of it uh, since very, very uh, long. And I must thank uh, Dr. Hunavar for including me. And uh, Rolika, of course, congratulations on uh, all behalf of all the viewers uh, for having uh, won the coveted uh, Rangachari. Excellent work done. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm sure you're a role model uh, to all the youngsters here that uh, you can achieve. We were just discussing that even as a postgraduate and as a fellow, if you can win such a big award, I mean, there are there's nothing that should hold you back. So beyond exams, there's a lot more. And uh, and with all of you having Dr. Parma as a mentor, I think uh, you'll have a long way to go and a, and a beautiful career ahead. So I will uh, start off with my uh, presentation. I'm going to be talking about, uh, you know, retina cases that can potentially come uh, for your uh, residency examinations. Uh, of course, this will also help uh, those who would like to pursue retina as a speciality. So I will not be going into a lot of uh, details, but I must tell you that uh, I have not really, uh, you know, taken any uh, exams in years. It's been uh, decades now since I last gave my exam. So I might be a little rusty. I have taken the help of a couple of my uh, residents to make this presentation and I must thank them for it. 
so I will be covering the common retina cases, no financial disclosures here. I was also told by uh, my uh, DNB uh, you know, students who took the examination uh, recently, um, thanks to COVID, that they didn't have real patients. They were only given uh, clinical images and uh, given a brief history or a background. And the questions were asked uh, based on that. So let's see how we can go about this. The plan is uh, that I will describe the case and the examination findings for each of them. Uh, let's look at the diagnosis uh, and the clinical investigations if I have for any of them. What is the important history for these cases, the important examination findings and the DDs? Especially for short cases, you may not be able to get an extensive history and an extensive examination may not be possible. So at least all the positive history and examination and a couple of the negative ones should be mentioned so that you come to a diagnosis. It's not only, uh, you know, for the examination uh, uh, presentation point of view, so that you yourself come to an accurate diagnosis. And the important uh, DDs are uh, also here mentioned because uh, you should not uh, come to a wrong diagnosis. So based on the exclusion, you come to the more final diagnosis. And also during your presentation, uh, you have to mention the differential diagnosis. So the examiner is aware that you know of the other potentials based on the findings here. So uh, this is the first case straight away, 62-year-old female. Uh, the history that we have here is uh, blurring of vision, gradual in onset and progressive in nature in both eyes since the past six months. Now, uh, we do need our uh, systemic, uh, uh, you know, history here. Uh, given the age, we are expecting some amount of uh, deficit, uh, you know, deficiencies to be there. Uh, patient is a diabetic since 15 years and a hypertensive since 12 years. So here the important history that should be taken besides uh, knowing what uh, the conditions that the patient have is also what is the control. Uh, how good is the, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, hypertensive control and the diabetic control? What is the type? Of course, I'll elaborate that in the history as well. So when you go over to the findings here, if you see the uh, uh, examination findings, the corrected distance visual acuity is, of course, very important. With respect to the anterior segment, uh, uh, briefly, there was uh, uh, most of the examination was normal and there was no neovascularization noted. Uh, the lens status is mentioned as nucleosclerosis, the vitreous was clear. Now, if you look at the fundus examination, if you look at just the positive findings, there were multiple dot and blot hemorrhages, microneurisms, and hard exudates were seen. So, okay, so uh, based on this, uh, if those in the hot seat would like to take a guess quickly what it could be. So I think uh, let's start going because uh, you see this is a way uh, we should discuss it out based okay. on history, blurred vision, both eyes and multiple hemorrhages and dot, blot. Yeah. What is the so potential, you know, diagnosis? Yes. Yeah. So it is diabetic macular edema, I guess. No. So what else is there other than macular edema? See, macular edema is part of it and macular edema can be then different conditions. But given the fact there's also dot and blot hemorrhages, there are micro NPDR, seen, yeah. Huh. yeah. Could be NPDR. Non so here you can... Yes. NPDR, this is in the right eye. These were the findings and these were the findings in the left eye. If you see the findings were much more in the left eye, so more extensive disease. So based on this uh, fundus picture and history and symptoms, uh, we're going with a diagnosis of non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So this was the clinical image that we have. You can see there the exudates. Uh, this is not a very zoomed up image, but you can see here uh, when we zoom up, you can see even the exudates and you can see some of the hemorrhages as well. So this is the left eye image. Again, you can see the scattered uh, hard exudates. You can also see the hemorrhages here. The disease manifestation is more extensive in the left eye. So in a patient with NPDR, you now know after you've examined the patient, you may sometimes want to go back and take some history that you've probably missed out. They usually have a gradual or an acute onset of vision and the uh, decreased uh, loss of vision could be either due to edema or even due to coexistent cataract. They complain of uh, deficits in the vision, central vision most often if they have an associated macular edema. Some patients may even be asymptomatic. You know, sometimes you tell them that, you, you know, you have this. They're like, no, my vision is absolutely fine. That's just because their macular is spared. Sometimes they may not even have a history of diabetes. You may be the person diagnosing these patients based on the findings. Most of them argue with you saying that, no, I don't have diabetes. When were you last tested for your sugars? Five years ago. 
Why do you think you don't have diabetes? Because I have no symptoms. So that's as simple as it can be, which is why you need to investigate them systemically. If they do have diabetes, make sure you take the type of diabetes because it presents at different uh, time intervals. It can have different intensities, severity, uh, age of onset. Everything is very important. The duration of the disease or diabetes is again important because the manifestation could be different based on the duration. How good is their control? Obviously, an uncontrolled diabetic is going to have more severe uh, complications. What medications they are on? A lot of them uh, who are on insulin tend to present with worse, uh, you know, illness. Now, other systemic illnesses, especially with diabetes, now that you've already seen it's an NPDR patient, you want to go back and ask these history, do they have a kidney issue? So many of them don't like to tell you that they're already on dialysis. You have to ask them whether they have hypertension, whether it's under control, what is their lipid status, whether they're on any statins, and important is anemia. We tend to miss out this because, uh, and other, uh, you know, blood abnormalities. A lot of these patients with diabetic macular edema or macular edema per se, as somebody's just mentioned, can present with something called as paraproteinemic maculopathy. I have seen that in a lot of patients. And when we investigated them further, they tended to have other conditions like anemia, or leukemia, and uh, lymphomas as well. Now, this is an important history in these patients because you want to inject them with anti or with steroids and you cannot do it if they've had a recent cardiovascular or a cerebrovascular incident. This is again something that you want to ask. Pregnancy, again, not only medication point of view, but it can cause worsening of the disease and any previous treatment is very important with, with term to laser and injection if they've received any. Mm -hmm. Now, coming to examination itself, besides the general physical examination, you want to look at anybody with a diabetic foot or an active in infection because you cannot give them, uh, you know, injection. But of course, lasers can be done. So don't send them away just after a physician clearance. Physicians, you know, tend to send them away. Uh, so that's the reason why you want to look at uh, diabetic foot. Iris, of course, for the neovascularization because you it there may be subtle uh, proliferative diabetic retinopathy itself. The minute you see NVI, you may want to investigate further. It could be uh, ocular ischemic syndrome. You may want to do the angiography here. Uh, intraocular pressure because a lot of these patients also have uh, primary open angle glaucoma and uh, neovascular glaucoma in advanced uh, disease. Lens, they have earlier onset of cataract, rapid progression could be there, acute onset also is seen. So the lens examination is very important. Look at the vitreous for any hemorrhage, look at the disc for neovascularization, papillopathy, glaucomatous changes, all coexistent conditions. In the retina itself, I cannot go into all the details, but what you have to mention is micronisms, retinal hemorrhages, heart exudates, cotton wool spots, venous bleeding, irmas, and macular edema, like we discussed, CSME, where you have to do a slit lamp biomicroscopy to look at the thickness, and also whether there is center involving or not. Important differential diagnosis is retinal vein occlusions, blood dysplasia, like I mentioned. Hypertensive retinopathy can also have cotton wool spots. So you want to make sure that it is not hypertensive retinopathy. OIS, I mentioned. Radiation retinopathy is very similar. And I have a patient who has both, has radiation retinopathy and diabetic retinopathy coexisting. Adult onset uh, post ports could also be seen and sometimes patients with a milder form of vasculitis. Now, going on to my second case, this is a 58-year-old female screened routinely for diabetic retinopathy, uh, did not come with any symptoms, a known case of diabetes on insulin-based treatment for the last 15 years, known case of hypertension under treatment since 8 years. Here again, you need to know about how good the control is. Patient has 6'6 vision, a no NVI, uh, you can see that the lens changes were minimal and the vitreous was clear. But in the fundus, there were microorganisms, the dot blot hemorrhages, neovascular fronts. So we already know the diagnosis since we just discussed it. So this is the fundus picture. Besides, uh, you know, all the other findings, you can see neovascularization here. And you can see that the foveal reflex is good here in both the uh, eyes. Therefore, the vision is good. But if you can see, there's a lot of neovascularization here. And uh, these are the kind of patients which are difficult to convince that they have a proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So very often, you may need to subject them to imaging. As you can see here, I don't know if you can see my cursor. This is the neovascularization that you can see here. Posterior pole hardly has any involvement, no edema. Here again, we had to do the angiography here in this particular patient to show them how their retina is involved and why they need treatment. So these are the ancillary investigations that you will need in these patients. 
This is another, this is the other eye of the patient. You can see this huge front here, which is uh, seen nasally. Uh, this was the angiography findings of this particular patient. And you can see the uh, leakage. So important history besides all the ones that I spoke about here is uh, nothing uh, beyond what we spoke for NPDR, but then in patients with PDR, you want to see the extent of the new vascularization. You want to see how severe the VH is and documented. And most importantly, the extent of the TRD should be mentioned. Basically, whether it is peripapillary, whether it is extramacular, you know, how much is the elevation? What is the state of the uh, posterior hyloid? These are some things that you will need to mention in your findings. And again, macular edema, the findings remain the same. Differential diagnosis is almost all the same. But here again, vasculitis becomes a very important thing because the findings would be very similar to a PDR patient. The age of onset, etc. would be different. So I think we've covered more or less diabetic retinopathy, both the non-proliferative and proliferative. Uh, so, so do you want any, to go into the discussion? Yeah, here? I think uh, if, if there are any queries or questions by the, you know, hot seats, uh, Reshma, Supriya or others, you can ask. How right this, can this second case be differentiated from ocular ischemic syndrome? So in ocular ischemic syndrome, you'll have involvement right from the anterior segment to the posterior segment. So you will see neovascularization of the iris as well. Uh, besides clinically, also you will be subjecting the patients to, since we are only talking uh, about uh, the findings, so you will see it there. Uh, it, it may be unilateral. A lot of the patients uh, present with bilateral findings in PDR. It is not a given, but usually you see some sort of positive findings in the other eye. Of course, investigation-wise, you will have to subject them to a character Doppler. You'll have to see uh, you know, a few other uh, investigation points. So, Supriya, whenever in patients of uh, uh, seemingly diabetic patients, and if you have a visual loss out of proportion to the you know, findings, you always think of OIS, ocular ischemia syndrome, and subject them to you know, investigation to rule out. Because ocular ischemia means the entire ocular surface ischemia. And hence, the neuroscalation of iris is pretty common in such conditions. So, if the retinal findings are you know, not very severe, but rubiosis and all these things are there, you start suspecting OIS. No, Chaitra? Yes, sir. And also yeah. the uh, laterality also. You don't yeah, tend to right. see it. So that's yeah, a, generally, a generally good there will be, Yeah, some asymmetry will be there. One eye, obviously. There. You see, both eyes symmetrical nahi hota hai, OIS. That is always there in uh, on uh, OIS. So I think uh, uh, Chaitra has, uh, you know, uh, very clearly uh, two cases, one of NPDR, one of PDR. PDR vision 6 by 6 so this happens very often. And uh, a lesson to be learned from the first case is patients may go for cathode surgery. And it is of your, uh, you know, uh, this thing to evaluate this patient properly so as to give them right prognosis and right treatment. So a lot of uh, people rush for cathode surgery and they will come for evaluation of cathode only. And so it is your job to evaluate the retina. And as I keep saying, no examination, eye examination complete without dilated retina examination. This you must tell because some people, you know, may not give you dilated pupil examination, but you say uh, the eye examination never, never complete without an indirect and without a dilated pupil examination. Then only you'll be able to, you know, uncover a lot of these findings. So as far as management is concerned, I think all of you know, because they have been covered uh, in, the, in the previous lectures, but these cases exemplify the, the, the findings per se, so that you should not falter in your diagnosis or DDX. I think Chaitra, we can move on. These two were diabetic processes. Yes, sir. So, I have not covered uh, uh, in detail investigations or uh, diagnosis, uh, the treatments so these of people that are now be... know. Yeah, yeah. Imaging yes, yes, and OCT. So, yes. these things are very well known now that uh, what is the finding on OCT and you have shown good angiograms also. See, most of the times, vision of 6 by 6, the people hesitate to get investigated unless you show them photographs, so, you know, you, you teach them. This is a abnormal area and if you don't do it, you can go permanent irreversible blindness also, especially in patients. She showed left a large front, large front. So you have to counsel this patient and that is where you have to spend a lot of time. It's any impossible case, to you... convince them for treatment yeah. if you don't show them where the pathology is. Yeah, so yeah. many of them say my vision is absolutely fine till they come back with a VH. So I think it's uh, these are the kind of patients you should push. Not because you cannot diagnose. Sometimes you need these tests just to convince the patient about the pathology or the seriousness or the severity. 
So uh, I would like to discuss a case, ma'am, because I have seen such case in which a patient was not diabetic, and he was six by six, and he was complaining of mild floaters, and I saw some fronds, and it was leaking. It was a very mild VH. He was six by six, and he was not also diabetic. And on FFA, we diagnosed that it was a neovascularization. So but yeah, secondary but to vasculitis, it could be could because be a, of a young be. patient. Yeah, okay. that's no, the reason I said one of yeah. the. Yeah, yeah, no, but even vasculitis is okay. not necessary. We do see it in uh, atypically in slightly elderly people. But one of the most important DDs for, uh, uh, you know, PDR is uh, vasculitis because it's yeah. very similar in presentation. So, Supriya, if you discover front incidentally in 6 by 6 in a non-diabetic patient, always think of vasculitis because for a front to develop, you have to have ischemia. Ischemia means yeah. vascular closure. Vascular closure means one of the DDs is vasculitis or a vascular block. So, let's go on. Lalit said there's another question in the chat box. For yeah, yeah, I saw that because uh, we will answer that Irma versus, uh, yes, I think we did discuss about this in uh, the lecture also, Irma versus Front. Chatra, would you like to take that now only? So, uh, we can finish it off, sir. So, it's it's basically how you, uh, you know, your examination findings are. So, Irma is actually very, very subtle. You know, clinically, you'll actually have to look for the Irma. And most like most often, I have to be very frank with you, I don't look for an Irma because it doesn't change my management. Whereas a neovascular frond is so much more superficial, you can very, very clearly see it. You can see it branching out so well. And uh, of course, a confirmatory diagnosis of both the two is the angiography. So yeah, uh, Irma, Irma will not leak on angiography. Leak. Whereas neovascular yes. is leak. Will leak. Yes. So that is 100% and in, 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 yeah, in, in neostration, you will have a brush-like vessels. You see these vessels are immature vessels in, uh, in neostration. As in Irma, they are not so fine vessels. They are, they are uh, slightly mature vessels and they are intra-retinal. They are intra-retinal neovascularization. These so are quite hundreds, superficial. The neovascularization that you see are more superficial. superficial. Ma'am, uh, can Irma's leak at a late phase in FFP? Yes, sometimes they can, but not as profusely that you can see. In the early phases yeah, okay. itself, you'll be able to differentiate between an IRMA and a neovascularization. And IRMA, as we all know, is primarily re basically required for your uh, classifications or your severity mm -hmm. of your NPDR. So yes. otherwise, we don't really target uh, them. It's to pick out the severity and when to call for follow-up. So leakage in IRMA is never, never profuse. But if you see neovascularization from early to late phase, you will have very the whole, everything will become white. Irma may have some endothelial decomposition, may slightly stain that wall, but it will never leak profusely. Profusely. Let's so go let's to the go next on. case. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. Seventy-six-year-old male with history of noticing baby lines while reading, gradual in onset and progressive in nature in the right eye since the past three months. No known systemic illnesses. So, based on just these points, anybody would like to consider what it is. Seventy-six-year-old. He's a male. Progressive baby lines. So what, do you, what do you think, Reshma or Supriya, about uh, this metamorphopsia? Wavy lines means yeah. metamorphopsia. metamorphopsia. Yeah. What do you think? Wet, wet AMD, NVM. Okay, good. So let's yeah, see good. the examination findings. So 660 vision, normal uh, antra segment, lens is NS2CC, clear vitreous, and you see a, a altered foveal reflex, a grayish yellow scarring foveal lesion. Okay, so now uh, when you're looking at the uh, fundus picture, so this is how it looks. You can see now be because of the uh, location of the membrane, the age of the patient, you're also seeing some amount of scarring. Your potential diagnosis here would be a uh, uh, neovascular membrane along with scarring. So this is how the picture in this particular patient was. And you can see the OCT. So, uh, you may be just given this OCT. If you're given an OCT uh, like this, what would you would uh, like to tell uh, Reshma? How would you like to describe this OCT? Yes, ma'am. The vitreomacular interface uh, has a hyperreflective membrane that could be a VMA, vitreomacular adhesion. The intraretinal uh, area shows uh, hyperreflective spaces, that is cystic spaces. Mm -hmm. And there is a hyperreflectivity at the RP layer. And okay, you have to uh, also come, some amount comment, of, uh, comment on the subretinal space. Subretinal space uh, shows a hyperreflectivity. Mm -hmm. And what about the hyperreflective spaces? You may have fluid also. Right. So mm -hmm. if you see hyperreflectivity, it will be SRF. 
and then uh, the new term for this is uh, shrimp subretinal mm-hmm. hyperreflective material mm-hmm. and then you com- uh, you know comment on the rp and the peds that you see so more right. important is that you see once you see an oct so if if only ocd is provided without any clinical picture or history you should be able to say the primary pathology you see all the hyperreflective spaces may be secondary issues so primary pathology is in and around the rp and brux membrane so meaning thereby we are tailing towards cnvm and cnvm ke secondary you can have all this cystic spaces fluid and shrum so ultimately you have to narrow down all your ddx into uh, after seeing the uh, this picture no great so the history that you would like to take there for this patient is uh, whether it is painless or uh, you know painful loss of vision how was the progression so if it is a gradual play, a painless loss of vision it could be a dry amd a lot of patients with uh, wet amd tend to present with sudden loss of vision of course the loss of vision is, could be because of uh, uh, right from uh, srf to a rip so that is a range that you can see hemorrhage intraretinal fluid they always say that i am missing letters i am unable to see faces i am unable to see my mobile uh, distorted vision or metamorphopsia like uh, sir said now uh, very important in these patients is to see what is their age because this is as the name mentions age related macular degeneration the race uh, you know you tend to see amd uh, dry amd a lot more in the western race the family history it is definitely genetic a smoking history i'm not going to all the detail history but i'm just giving you this white trauma because you can also have a traumatic uh, cnvm in a younger patient you can have post inflammatory you can have angioid streaks as a cause for cnvm so all those need to be ruled out and if you can rule out in your history nothing like it also patient with a high minus power you can also see myopic cnvms in the elderly it doesn't mean that only young patients you can see myopic cnvm you will decide that based on their uh, you know refractive error and the other eye finding so therefore they, it becomes very important that cnvms can have other underlying pathologies other than age itself so why do you need these examination findings is to come to the underlying pathology of your cnvm look for drusen look for pigment epithelial abnormalities look for geographic atrophy in the other eye uh, if you're looking at the cnvm you need to look at the, the subretinal fluid the exudates the intraretinal subretinal hemorrhage you also need to see the uh, you know the, the different types of peds that you can have how are they where are they located you can also sometimes uh, you know pick up uh, pcv in these patients and very importantly well, uh, clinically itself you can mention whether there is a rip or not or so not. as soon as as soon as you see a picture like this immediately as chatra was saying all the causes of cnvm whether it is inflammatory myopic or uh, you know ipcv or traumatic they should immediately come to a flash in your mind and also start thinking about uh, you see examiner may ask for something the ddx as well as the approach to management and that, that is the reason you have to think of say injections part of you also and what kind of injections they should immediately start you know uh, you know thought was in your brain yeah and if there is coexisting diabetes you may want to uh, figure out whether it's a diabetic maculopathy or not because if i showed you that uh, the, if you go back to the clinical image Uh, it was very similar to a diabetic maculopathy. There is a exudates. There could be a coexistent diabetic retinopathy. So we do see in this age group coexisting conditions. Some retinal dystrophies, especially when you have uh, dry AMD, can uh, also need to be differentiated. So, uh, so case one, number one four, line I would like to say, Chetra, yes, sir. one line only that yes. you see diabetic patient does not necessarily mean all maculopathy is diabetic maculopathy only. So remember this. Just because you patient gives a history of diabetes and you see something in macula, does not mean it's maculopathy only. It could be. It could be RMD also. Yes. So let's go on to the fourth case. Okay. So next case is a sixty-two-year-old female who presented with diminution of vision in the left eye since a day. She had history of undergoing cataract surgery in both eyes twenty years ago. So that is quite long. what do you think uh, could be the reason uh, why she is uh, undergone cataract surgery or lens surgery for that matters at 42 years of age that one itself day, one, should get you no, thinking one day one day vision loss yes just one day vision loss and 20 years back she's undergone cataract surgery so uh, let's go on so this is a visual activity 66 and everything else is normal in the right eye tcr in both eyes like the history mentioned on the left eye she's got counting fingers close to face 
So it is possible that 20 years ago, she underwent a lens extraction or a cataract surgery also because she was a myo. A lot of these patients come later presenting with these kind of uh, pictures. So she had a near total retinal detachment. And uh, these are all the different findings that I'll explain to you on the diagram itself. So things that you need to look for is the extent of the retinal detachment, what kind of retinal detachment, whether uh, if it is a regardi, whether there is PVR or not, whether there's PVD or not, and the macular involvement. So this is the left eye image. What all do you see here? I'm not labeled it just so that one of you can take the uh, questions. Anybody would like okay. to describe this? There's a hot shot here at the 11 o'clock position. No, you have to start. That's the uh, you know positive. You have to start, start right from start everything. That is a, yeah, it's a picture of left eye and you see yes. all the findings. findings. Yeah. yeah, it's a picture of left eye where we can see a macula of RD which is extending yeah. from uh, uh, 3 o'clock uh, uh, in supra nasal and supra temporal part and supra nasal and, and supra temporal from 5 to 9 uh, nine o'clock position and there we can see in hot shoot here at 11 o'clock position. Okay. So you have to mention whether there's PVD or not, whether it's total or partial, if it's there are any PVR partial, changes yeah. or not. So there's these no are all the findings. Yeah. Yes, these are all the findings that you have. So a near total uh, regmatogenous RD involving the macula with the hot shoot air located uh, superior nasal. Or closer to the center. So that's so our diagnosis. Immediately, what should flashes or link offs rule and three, Everything. four modalities of management of RD, starting from buckling, starting from VR surgery, pneumoretinopexy, everything should start flashing in your mind. And DDX. That is why these uh, P, the PVR and the PVD status is very yeah. important because Sir was mentioning treatment. So if you don't look for all these, you cannot plan accordingly because regmatogenous is definitely a surgical indication uh, for management, right? So these findings are very, very important. So if you say, no, I can't see any PVR, that means the examiner knows that, uh, you know, if you mention what PVR, you may think uh, directly about the vitreous procedure. Yes. So here is the image of that uh, particular patient. And uh, so the provisional diagnosis for this patient is all these points that I've mentioned are very important. Pseudophakia, horseshoe tear, because they all help you in managing the patient or writing the exact management when you're giving in your, uh, you know, clinical uh, presentation. So it's near total regmatogenous, macula is detached, there's a partial PVD and no PVR. So we've already discussed why each of these things are important, whether you want to do a nemoretinopexy, whether you want to do just a buckle, or do you want to do a vitrectomy with a, a band buckle support? So these are all the important things in this diagnosis that help you make that decision. So this is another patient. I just thought I'd show you a couple of other images. This is a patient. Uh, this is the right eye picture. You can see a pigmented lattice degeneration here. And this is the left eye. So already here, the, the findings are put. There's a detached retina involving the uh, macula. And there's an inferior retinal uh, lattice degeneration. There's an atrophic hole there. And you can see that the superior retina is attached. Why do you see uh, a subretinal band there? Is probably because it is a old standing uh, inferior RD. Now, based on this picture, you may also want to take a call on how you want to treat this eye. And a lot of these patients with chronic RDs like this, with an atrophic hole, may not uh, may not even have a PVD. Then again, it helps make a decision on whether you want to do a buckle for this particular patient, and definitely. Uh, do a prophylactic barrage for the other eye. So this is the uh, picture of the patient. So this is the right eye picture, which I was showing you the lattice, and this is the left eye. You can see the subretinal bands there. You can see the inferior uh, uh, lattice there, and you can see the hole in the lattice. So immediately something should start flashing. What are the indications of doing a prophylactic, uh, you know, barrage laser, and uh, uh, how to manage the the uh, left eye? Your superior is attached, maybe it's a younger patient, maybe maybe we prefer, you know, a band buckle in this patient. And since PVD may not be there, surgery of VR may be slightly difficult, long-standing. So unless there's a PVR, most of the times, uh, even the principal band, we do uh, initial, uh, you know, give a try of band buckling. buckling. 
Yes. Then they do fairly well. Young patients, uh, especially because their lens is still clear, you know, with vitrectomy and gas or oil, you can induce lens changes. The only issue with these younger patients is they're already myo. A lot of them would have undergone a refractive surgery. They do not want to wear spectacles. And then you put in a buckle, you'll induce a refractive error, uh, you know, refractive uh, change again. So sometimes they're unhappy, but they are uh, uh, initially, but in the long run, since they do so well, without an uh, intraocular procedure, they are quite happy. So uh, at times you... Yeah. Sometimes, I mean, I may provoke you, you know, several bands uh, is an old RD. So, but believe me, these patients, as Chatra was saying, do very well with buckling. So don't get unnecessarily provoked that presence of cervical band is definite indication of VR surgery. No, answer is no. And the, all cervical bands may not contribute to the uh, detachment also. So you should be very firm in saying, sir, we will try buckle procedure first because of his age, because of his uh, absence of PVD and a buckleable lesion, which can be easily buckled in long term. Results are very good. They may take some time to ultimately improve to you know good vision, but the results are pretty good. Yes. And uh, most of the old uh, examiners, old timers especially, are very pro-buckling. So don't go in, uh, you know, uh, with a bait like uh, Sir was saying. They may want to push you to say vitrectomy and then you'll get into more trouble. So they might ask you what kind of investigations you may want to do in case the media is not clear. So yes, so this is uh, B-scan sometimes helps you uh, also identify other complications that can occur. So coming to the important history, most of them present with flashes and floaters, loss of vision or a field defect. They can present with a history of trauma. If they don't give you a history, please ask. These are the positive histories that you should take from them. If they've undergone any previous surgery, if they've undergone yak capsulotomy, these are all very, very, uh, you know, risk, uh, high risk procedures. Look for systemic history, especially if there's a tractional retinal detachment or an exudative and a family history because a lot of these are syndromic you know, like Marfins and Stickler. So you want to also take a family history. Now coming to the examination findings, first and foremost, please determine what is the type of RD, whether it's exudative, whether it's combined, whether it's TRD, whether it's a reg RD. And based on that, you can then look for other signs of trauma. If there's a reg RD, you want to look at the lens, you want to look at the zonules. So an overall eye examination to figure out whether there is any other sign of trauma. The vision and refraction is important because a lot of them are myops and they tend to be more uh, at a risk for regardi. The pupillary reaction for RAPD, especially in these patients with regardies, the IOP, they can be hypotenous eyes, especially when there is a coexisting uh, you know, choroidal detachment. Uh, PSC is very common in these patients, especially it could be a complicated cataract in long-standing retinal detachments. Look at the vitreous, extremely important to plan your surgery. There could be vitreous degeneration. Look at the uh, PVD status, tobacco dusting. Sometimes, you know, when you cannot differentiate between the type of RD, a tobacco dusting is more in uh, favor of a reg RD. When you can't find a break, uh, you, you do know that uh, it could be a very tiny break or sometimes, you know, the, the break is even closed if it was very, very tiny by a vitreous plug. What about uh, VH? You can see VH not only in TRD patients, but you can also see it in patients with reg RD, especially through the break if there's a, uh, you know, bridging vessel you could still have a VH. These are the times when a B-scan can help you even pick up a regma when you haven't seen it clinically because of a VH. So when you're looking at a regmatogenous RD, you want to identify the extent of the RD, fresh or old, because you need to plan the surgery accordingly, identify the location, the type, and the number of retinal breaks, whether it's an atrophic hole, whether it's an opened up lattice, whether it's an HST, the grade of PVR, whether the macula is on or off, or the presence of other risk factors. So the important differential diagnosis is many people, uh, even with a PVD, could tell you that they have flashes. So then uh, you can't assume that every patient uh, with a presenting with photopsia does have a reg RD, which is hemorrhage also. Sometimes I've seen uh, referrals uh, coming uh, saying that there is an RD because it, it could be a white VH. And you're seeing the posterior hydroid, it looks like an RD. Then a confirmation, definitely a, a B scan. Retinoschisis, many of them think that it, it could be an RD. Uh, TRD and exudation, of course, they have their own, uh, you know, differential diagnosis. And retinal mass, sometimes just because it's raised, it looks like a retinal detachment. Of course, there could be a coexisting exudative RD in these patients. And uh, uh, CDs, many patients, especially post uh, you know, glaucoma surgeries uh, are referred to us uh, thinking that it is a retinal detachment. 
So most often it's just a, a parotid detachment which re uh, resolves with treatment. So any discussion, sir, we've done a discussion as and when we've uh, done the findings. So if there's no specific questions, I think we can go uh, forward yes, because it's I already... I think let's go on because let's yeah, cover more variety, variety, variety of Yes, this. yes. So this is a case number five, a 63-year-old uh, gentleman came with gradual, painless, progressive blurring of vision in both eyes for several years, both for distance and near. So the several years is a clincher here. Though it's a 63-year-old male, there is no known uh, systemic illnesses. So which itself, when the patient says several years, we can think of the different uh, diagnosis, whether it is a posterior pole involvement or whether it is the entire retina is involved, no systemic illnesses, what could it be? So this is when a family history again becomes very important. So here, uh, based on my uh, fundus findings, I'm going straight away. There's articular narrowing, there's an epiretinal membrane bony spicules, altered the foveal reflex. So what is what are you thinking? What's going on in your mind? Quickly, answers. Reshma. Retinitis pigmentosa. Okay, good, uh, Supriya. So this is the uh, fundus charting uh, made for this patient. You can see uh, whatever I just described has been described uh, here as a diagrammatic representation. So like you both said, it is a patient of RP. This is the clinical picture in both of them. So this is also the FAF, uh, which helps pick up subtle changes, which you may not see clinically in all patients. So going to the important history in these patients, they should uh, ask probe for difficulty in night vision or dark adaptation. They may not come up, especially after seeing the fundus picture. See, because the history was so vague, you may want to go back and take this history. How is the peripheral visual field? Many of them are actually driving, you know, even with such extensive involvement. What is the visual acuity? It could be decreased. Most often the central, uh, you know, vision tends to be retained, but they could still have a CME or a cataract or an ERM uh, contributing to their decreased visual acuity. Pass history to detect any syndromic RPs. This is again very important. You want to ask whether there's any hearing loss, any, uh, you know, uh, differences in their gait. You, you know the different uh, symptoms that can be there. A family history, very important. Pedigree charting, at least of three generations to pick up the inheritance pattern. So this is one, uh, you know, a pedigree charting of this uh, particular patient that was done here. You can see the proband there, 67-year-old male. And then you figure out, therefore, you can come to a potential uh, inheritance pattern. Now coming to the, and if you add the pedigree, uh, you know, you have a good chance of uh, getting extra, uh, you know, marks by the examiner. So general physical examination, very important. You want to look at hearing loss, speech disorders, if any, vision and refraction, because these patients tend to have some amount of myopia. Look at the cornea. Some of them could have a keratoconus here. Uh, intraocular pressure, because they have associated open angle glaucoma. PSC is very common in these patients. They also have vitreous degeneration and tend to have early uh, uh, PVD. Waxy pallor of the disc, we all know. Arteriolar narrowing, pigmentary changes. Macular uh, edema, it could be CME, epiretinal membrane, or atrophy. So I've only given you the important uh, examination findings. There could be more. And especially in atypical uh, RP, the changes will be completely different. They could not even have pigment. So that's the reason I've only uh, spoken about uh, typical RP because you will not get the more complicated retinal uh, dystrophies. So look at, uh, these are uh, fundus appearance that are similar to RP, which can easily be differentiated based on the age, the past history, the drug history, the lasers, uh, treatment, if any, old retinal detachments, of course, this will be unilateral and RP will be uh, bilateral. Any trauma can have pigmentary changes. Most likely these diagnoses are because of the pigmentary changes. Chronic uveitis and cancer associated retinopathy are some of the findings. So, any pointers, anything you'd like to add, sir? Uh, no, I think because once you talk of retinitis pigmentosa, uh, people may, you know, ask you about what are the, you know, because diagnosis is pretty simple in such patients. Diagnosis is not difficult at all. So, they may ask about what the treatable causes of, uh, you know, nyctalopia, your night blindness, they may go depth into night blindness. Then you should also know EOG, uh, what is, uh, you know, that yes. K point and all these things. So immediately you see, start thinking about say because Argus processes, which was discussed. So depending on the you know how how uh, knowledgeable the examiner is, he may yes. go on and on. 
diagnosis yeah, is so not electrophysiology like sir said is very important in these patients they will definitely ask you so uh, if uh, you know unfortunately you get a patient of rp please quickly go through your uh, erg uh, knowledge for the exam yeah so next case is a 59 year old uh, gentleman presented with sudden non progressive diminution of vision in the right eye since 3 months and he had visited a local hospital already where he was given an intravitreal injection after which his vision improved but it deteriorated again after a few weeks what are you all thinking what could be potential i'm not giving you the systemic uh, uh, illness still but what could be what's probably one or two things on your mind supriya yes here yes. csr yes, no 59 mm, but he's got an intravitreal injection yeah. csr means crvo yeah. any pain in the muscle it's probably right could be could be you you get is also could be so this patient is a hypertensive he is also a hyperlipidemia on treatment and he's undergone a cabg 10 years back and he's on clopidogrel and aspirin so more and more we're getting into more of the details so on examination this patient has a superotemporal venous tortuosity with cirrhosis vessels and there's a neovascularization uh, at the disc and elsewhere and cme more, can you tell me what you think it is BRV, no. BRVO, BRVO, like. superotemporal BRVO. So this is the image. You can see the sclerosis mm -hmm. vessels. You can see the neovascular fronts and the macular edema and NVD as well. So we're looking at a retinal vein occlusion. So this is the image there, as you can see. Here again, you will uh, important thing that you need to differentiate here is between collaterals and neovascularization. Sometimes it is a difficult thing, so the questions will be asked. you need to mention things like watershed zone you need to mention about how you will go ahead and confirm using uh, diagnostic modalities if it is not clear clinically so here you can see the neovascularization you can also see the collaterals you can see the non perfusion areas and most often the neovascularization is adjacent to the non perfusion areas so this is the uh, you know more detail and uh, what else that you can see here is also the macular edema on the angiography so that's your flower petal and this is your uh, oct again which has confirmed uh, most often you may not need to do the angiography in these patients you get most of the information either on an oct or an octa but if you want to do a targeted prp if the examiner asks you that you know i want to just target the neovascular uh, non perfusion areas then the angiography is definitely helpful so the important history here is what kind of vision loss was it painless painful was it just blurring or loss of vision completely and was it progressive non progressive sudden gradual all are important in these cases why is the onset of floaters important because a lot of them could have already had uh, some amount of bleeding a lot of the vascular occlusions also could have occlusive vasculitis so in these patients floaters could have been there even without bleed so again a very very important history in these patients they could have be uh, no symptoms as well if there's just an incident of peripheral vein occlusion we see that very often when the macula is not involved systemic illness is very important again because they are the uh, you know for uh, can give rise to all these uh, conditions but it does not mean that only if you have some detected systemic illness they can have rvos many of them turn out with a clean chit hypercoagulability very important in these patients looking at examination findings systemic examination very important in the anterior segment look for nbi nba in the vitreous look for vh in the disc look for neovascularization in the retina a extent of involvement you want to look at whether it's a macular brvo whether it's superior inferior temporal nasal hemicentral or central all those are very very important you want to look at the macular involvement because it's only when the macula is involved that they are more amenable to treatment and investigations if there is macular edema you can also see erms in these patient especially if they have already undergone laser treatment differential diagnosis dr and vasculitis i've kept them predominant but you can also have it in a lot of uh, other uh, vasculitis especially when you have these hemoglobinopathies and other uh, blood diseases so anything you'd like to add so i just have i think another two cases only yeah you know already the other thing is in a vascular block always remember it may not always be a related to hypertension in a young patient same finding for chetra short could be inflammatory vascular block also so then he, they, then you have to see the other eye uh, to rule out vasculitis and sometimes you may pick up front or non perfusion area in the other eye also so always remember that other eye examination is always always more important than the uh, this eye 
uh, that is true for long case. In fact, short case they are get only for one eye only. One eye. Yeah. So this is a 29 year old uh, young male complaining of sudden painless diminution of vision in the left eye since one day. Okay, that's all is the history. No systemic issues or probably no known systemic issues. Smoking cigarettes since ten years, one packet per day. What do you think it is? What could it be? Arterial, arterial, arterial occlusion. Yes, dear. I think you mentioned here. Yeah, you mentioned first before young yes. patient sudden. Yes, dear. Sudden, sudden one day. So. Yes, Mrs. Disease. Ah, uh, the thing is, arterial CSR occlusion. will not sudden sudden CSR will generally. I don't know. They don't uh, usually complain don't, that yeah. much in one day. They wait. And, and we as Chetra is emphasizing smoking, so you have to see what is being emphasized here. So, so this is the so, patient uh, with hand movements. Yeah, so obviously not CSCR. Uh, and uh, there is RAPD. Lens is clear. Vitreous is clear, which means it's not a vasculitis or eels. And we don't call it eels anymore. We call it vasculitis. So there's a cherry red spot with posterior pole whitening, and one of your grid mentions. So it is a patient with uh, uh, CRAO, yeah. and let's look at the findings here. You can see a cherry red spot. You can see box scarring of vessels, and uh, this patient unfortunately turned out to have a central retinal arterial occlusion. So this is the picture here. You can see the box scarring. I hope it's visible here, or tram yeah. trucking as we call it, and you can see a. Uh, unfortunately, a cherry red spot there. So here, important history is that it was sudden and onset. And young patient, we are seeing it very, very common because of lifestyle diseases. Systemic disorders are very important again to find out what is the underlying cause. Trauma. I have also seen patients presenting with CRAO post trauma, and uh, they have luckily recovered. Uh, quite well. Important examination findings again systemic. Look at the vision. How bad it is? The pupillary reaction, the disc pallor, the retinal whitening with a cherry red spot, and it also depends on the chronicity. In acute, you may not have major disc findings. Later on, you will find some changes there. Important differential diagnosis. I'm only going to give it for cherry red spot because CRAO most often is a very clear cut uh, diagnosis when you see it. But still, patients uh, some there is some support, amount of ambi ambiguity. But when you're looking at bilateral, uh, you're looking more at metabolic disorders, any drug toxicities and uh, C, uh, LCA. Uh, but in unilateral, uh, the prime uh, differential diagnosis here would be CRAO. Orbital contusions, we see it. Macular holes, sometimes people have uh, you know, got confused when there's also a retinal detachment there. Or a macular hemorrhage sometimes is a differential diagnosis. So when you see CRAO, chiral spot, the whole diagnosis will shift to chiral spot only. Yes. So unilateral, bilateral, and why, why, what, 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 what is it? What does cherry look like? And what is this spot? Then how can this be spared? If you have only ciliary retinal artery occlusion, or if you have ciliary retinal artery spared, patient may still have six by six vision, and it's an emergency kind of situation. You have to manage it promptly. You see, there is one of the emergencies in the eye. So all these things should flash in your mind. And exactly uh, like sir mentioned, age of onset also. When do you see ah. a cherry red spot in young? When do you see it in old? And since this is a you know a patient who's 29 year old, it can be very very confusing when you're seeing a cherry red spot and undetected. You know, was it an undetected medic metabolic uh, you know disease in this patient? So it becomes very confusing. But now uh, after you've examined and you've seen the retinal whitening and you see the vision, it uh, makes it all the more clear. So this is the last uh, case, 57-year-old female presented with gradual progressive diminution of vision in the left eye since one month. No known systemic illnesses, no history of trauma. Now this is, you know, opens it up. You have no idea what it is. So let's look at the examination findings. The right eye is quite normal, whereas the left eye vision is 624. And it's a very, very obvious full thickness, uh, you know, macular hole here. So going to the picture, this is how we have to depict it. And this is how the clinical image looks. As you can see, you see those deposits are pretty common there uh, in a macular hole. Uh, why uh, I'm speaking about the OCT is because in the macular hole, it's very, very important. Not only do you need the OCT for staging, you also want to look at the different indices to give rise, uh, to help you prognosticate. So important history is patient could be even asymptomatic in uh, you know, early stages. Metamorphopsia is what they most often come with. They come also with loss of central vision or missing letters. 
this decrease in the visual acuity itself. Similar complaint in the fellow eye because at least 15 to 20 percent of them tend to have bilateral involvement. Trauma is an important history for post-traumatic macular holes. Posture-related issues. You should ask these patients. Many of them will complain of low back pain and if you have not taken spondylitis, undergone some spinal surgery, they may not be able to do the pos position post-surgery. Uh, examination findings, macular, of course, you want to stage the macular hole to, whether to decide on surgery. Other eye examination, very, very important to pick up an early macular hole, prepares the patient for surgery in the other eye subsequently. Periphery is important because a lot of them have an anonymous uh, PVD in these patients. Also, you want to know uh, because if you're inducing a PVD, if, uh, whether there are any peripheral you know, retinal thinning or tears or holes it can be induced iatrogenic. So very important to see these patients periphery. Other signs of trauma or secondary causes for macular holes is, uh, you know, even patients with adaptive retinopathy or, uh, uh, can present with the macular holes. So you need to know what are the other causes of uh, secondary macular holes. These are some of the tests that you will be expected to know or do uh, or demonstrate. So you need to know this. And OCD, of course, is extremely important in these patients, both for staging and the indices that I mentioned. What are the different diagnoses? Two important ones. You can also have uh, the cherry red spot that we just uh, discussed. A pseudo hole or a lamellar hole. In pseudo holes, you don't have loss of tissues, usually secondary to an ERM that is pulling uh, it apart and giving it an exp uh, you know, like a, a appearance of a macular hole. In lamellar hole, the outer retina is uh, still uh, intact, so uh, it is only a partial uh, hole. They also will have an uh, coexisting uh, epiretinal membrane sometimes. So some of the other cases, so this is a patient uh, with an uh, ERM, as you can see there. And this is the clinical picture. You can see the ILM folds there, and you can see sometimes beautifully in a clear media, the extent of the ERM, it helps. So also plant surgeries in the multiple dermages. You can have a, an image given of uh, just a coloboma here. This patient also has a, a vein occlusion. So this is a patient with, we've been uh, talking about this now. CSR. CSR. Exactly, yes. So CSCR, other things that you want to look for in a CSCR is the uh, whether there is a pachychoroid, whether there is a PD, uh, whether there is some amount of, uh, you know, how is the fluid, whether it's turbid or not, it will tell you whether there is any fibrin deposit it gives you indication of the chronicity, whether you want to treat. You know, this C uh, CSCR, again, is a very, very important uh, disease. And most often, they might just give you an OCT and go forward. What is the investigation that they might talk about to determine the pattern of leakage? Is your angiography, you want to look at ink plot or smokestack? They will ask you, uh, you know, the different ways that I've shown you both here. What is this? This is your B scan. What do you want to show? Uh, what do you think is the diagnosis here? PVD, ma'am. What is behind PVD? Subhyaloid hemorrhage. Very yeah. good. Yeah, so yeah. you want to look at uh, subhyaloid hemorrhage here. Of course, uh, B scan ideally is dynamic, so you will be able to comment more on the membrane. Look at the A scan to look at the reflectivity of the membrane before you say, why, why can't it be a subretinal uh, hemorrhage? RD with subretinal hemorrhage. So the reflectivity is very, very important of the membrane. Okay, the movement, the attachment to the disc. These are some things that they will ask you when you want to differentiate. The thing is so, you can sometimes ask also because this scan particular does not show disc photograph. Yes, so, exactly. Because it is very important uh, to, you see, for saying RD, you have to have that octagon of shadow coming around. Then only you should come in. You can, you can tell this photograph does not show that. So... So I that was my last picture. I had a lot more pictures, both uh, yeah. fundus, SAN, B-scan, OCT, ICG, Octa, but it was impossible to complete it all in an hour. So I just uh, you know, did some of my major cases, which I thought will come, but uh, it's a Pandora's box. You may need yeah. to know each and everything, anything and anything can come. Examiners can come with their images, so it's difficult to tell. I must, uh, before I uh, conclude, thank my uh, uh, you know fellows and uh, PGs who have been a great help to put this together. And uh, this is a lot of the DDs that I've picked up are, is from this textbook. I think all uh, uh, you know postgraduates going for either MS or DO or DNB should have this. Uh, excellently put uh, uh, cases together. Uh, the DDs especially are very very good and uh, also. 
the important uh, you know uh, examination points so this is uh, uh, since it's a retina thing this image is also from that book uh the, the examiners will expect you to do the amsler's chart you will need to mention whatever there is i think this has covered a lot of them couple of them pre- probably are missing uh, i think the disc uh, findings especially but this is covers uh, almost all of them. thank you so much rolika sir thank anything else thank you so much ma'am no, wonderful chatra because the aim obviously is you cannot cannot cover each and every pathology aim was to expose the you know the audience and the you know all this uh, budding uh, uh, surgeons how to approach a patient of uh, short case of retina so chatra did describe eight uh, common pathologies which all of us see and in the last uh, slide we talked about uh, csr ear and coloboma and uh, and uh, these kind of uh, sub highlights i think the approach is uh, my uh, you know advice would always be never never jump to diagnosis so do not immediately jump uh, to diagnosis always describe findings first you see the examiner at this stage is looking for findings and like uh, you know chatra showed diagram so start this is the photograph of left eye and the disc looks okay or vessels are this and then macula then extra macula findings and then slowly slowly tailor your uh, you know this thing even if you know the diagnosis please don't jump to csr or uh, you know other things that uh, the examiner sometimes get very irritated in this uh, you know uh, you do that so that is my advice uh, pick up all the findings and very important things chatra in all the eight cases she listed three important things after uh, initial you know uh, intro of the patient sometimes you may have to go back to the history after you pick up uh, you know you see the fundus or you see the nps segment sometimes you may have to go back and ask some points in the history so as to you know come um, narrow down your ddx also and sometimes also uh, what important examination findings what ddx and what sh- what investigations and what should be the approach all these things should start flashing in your mind uh, immediately so i think uh, a huge pandora box that chatra was saying but yes. i think these these were the common cases which uh, all of us see in our practice right from detachment to you know vitreous macular disorders to macular hole to to erm to degardis and vascular block so i think a great job has been done and uh, emphasis has not been on management today emphasis has been how to approach this patient how to think of the differential diagnosis and what is the most important point in the history uh, which uh, can be emphasized and always go back always go back to history and uh, because you may think of say trauma you may have missed trauma if you see you know some findings say subluxation or some uh, subretinal bands you start thinking but wonderful job done chatra not an easy job uh, to you know given one hour about this yes. uh, huge pandora and uh, i think i on behalf we have finished in time uh, rolika and on behalf of the entire cfs team and uh, santosh uh, and rolika and all these uh, wonderful ladies who keep helping us every time thank you from core of our heart for sparing time for uh, i focus and center for sight thank you so much sir you, it's been a sir. privilege and pleasure thank you sir and thank, thank you, you so for much. holding this together and giving those very important uh, you know uh, take home for each one of the cases i think uh, like sir said it is not the diagnosis yeah. it's how well you pick up the findings and describe them because in your description will be your diagnosis a membranous uh, shadows noted or a membranous lesion noted in that you will get your diagnosis so you do the the, uh, the basically the examiner should know it is not just a view you have gone into the depth of the findings so that's what you need to convey and i think that's your job well done wish you all the very very best all of you all are going to rock it and uh, just stay focused thank you so much ma'am and you're thank an inspiration you, for all of us your energy keeps us going so thanks a lot for that ma'am and you have not just described the cases you've also made them understand how to go about each and every case and how to put it together so that has been very helpful and uh, thank you lalit prema sir as always for the wonderful discussion it it is never possible without you sir thank so you so glad he was there for retina <laughs> yeah Yes, definitely, <laughs> definitely. Okay, so our next lecture is going to be on June tenth. That will be again the exam special of long cases in retina by Dr. Manoj Khatri. So we'll all see you there. Yes. So let's Thank all congratulate Chatra for a good job done. And Thank really you so much, ma'am.
Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye.